if he complains to an officer about something, the officer is more likely to com ignore the complaint. Uh, and if he's seen the complaint of the officer, he's branded as a, a dog or a traitor and suffers the consequences of that. So uh, you very quickly learn to be a survivor, to, uh, to grab whatever you can to protect yourself whenever you can. If you're strong, if you're not strong, well, you'll fall aside and become one of the victims of the prison system. But the social order in prisons is changing, as the society outside is changing. And the reason is the same, drugs. Pouring into Australian prisons is a swelling torrent of drug-related offenders. They neither know, respect, nor conform to the unwritten code of prison ethics. I was out of jail for six years. And when I came back into jail after, after the six years, I found it a totally different situation. The prisoners were, were totally different. That the whole system had changed and I regard this as being related to drugs because the guys who are on drugs now don't seem to have the same moral ethics that we had of years gone by. You know, they just, they don't consider other people at all other than what they for themselves. And this is a junky mentality. It just seems to be their mentality that, that they, you know, it's me, 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 and not us. And the jail situation has just gone to the shit house. I mean, it's just shot. Today, seven out of ten of the record flood of prisoners into Australian jails are there because of drug-related offences. Inside as outside, Australia has dangerously underestimated the impact of drugs on us all. I've been using heroin for a long time outside and I can't recall one suburb that I haven't been to where heroin wasn't available, at least from one source. Um, it's a lot more widespread than the public seem to believe. Nearly every hotel has at least went heroin dealer, as well as many other people who have been driven underground by police pressure and that sort of thing. Um, it's available um, in such enormous proportions that it could only be um, compared to a plague because it's just going to get worse and worse. It's already got a firm grip on society's youth and quite a lot of older people as well. I built my first lot and from then it went. I went every day from one cap to two, three caps, four or five, till it started to get $200, $300 a day. Not to, uh, I just, just sold everything I had, everything. I, I had no money left. I was borrowing money of friends and trying to hide the fact that I was already addicted to heroin. I was losing weight. And, uh, even my children at the stage didn't know I, I was on heroin. And until uh, finally there was no money left, friends started to disappear. They just couldn't give me any more money. And uh, then I met a few uh, unreliable characters and go out and do a couple of burglaries. And believe me, when you're hanging out, you'll do anything. I mean, it's pretty... Uh, you th I think about it now and imagine what it must have looked like. <laughs> a 40-year-old woman getting in a house in a bedroom window carrying out a television set. But I did it because I was so ill. I had to have that, that hit. Um, I'd usually go, I'd usually go and shoplift, um, sell the clothes that I got hop whatever I had, anything of value. Um, sometimes, in extreme cases, I might do... Oh, I don't know if I should say this on television. <laughs> might be giving myself up. Um, I'd go in a couple of breaking in and um, sell whatever electrical appliances I could get from them. It was just mainly just things like that, desperate things. So um, the future is just going to be a continuance of crime and um, violence is uh, going to be involved too because people are going to commit hold-ups and assault and robberies 
And I know what I've been like several times during hold-ups. I've uh, very much wanted to shoot people because they, they want to play games and uh, didn't want to hand over the money and that sort of thing. Um, I was, I've been lucky that I haven't had to do anything extremely violent to obtain the money from that person. But um, I'm worse than ever and I just increasingly get worse each time I come back to prison because it makes me more and more desperate. So um, I would not rule out the possibility that I could quite easily commit murder or any, any other act to support a heroin addiction. In the last five years, the number in jail has doubled. A good script perhaps for the fiction of a television series, but in reality, infinitely sad. For the pressures of addiction have pushed women into armed hold-ups, break and enters, anything to pay for the narcotics they have come to crave. I'd say at a rough guess, as high as 90% of women in prison are here on drug-related charges. It's amazing. Well, I'd say at a rough estimate it would be about 95% of women are in here for drug and alcohol related crimes and I don't feel that anything much is done for them. I mean, on, a, on arrival here, a brief history of their drugging and drinking history is taken by the sister in reception and they're taken down to the annex and treated like animals basically because they're hanging out. And I mean, addiction is a disease like any other disease and they should be given the appropriate medical treatment but at the moment they're not and they're not encouraged to go to drug and alcohol classes. One Narcotics Anonymous meeting a week and, um, and one drug and alcohol class a week. And I just feel that's not appropriate considering that most people would go out and are likely to be re-offenders. The Minister, the Attorney General, the Honourable Jim Cannon, to officially open the drug treatment unit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be able to officially open uh, this unit today. A new drug treatment unit is opened in Melbourne's Pentridge Jail. There's one in Parkley Prison in New South Wales and one in South Australia as well. In this unit, 20 prisoners will live in a drug-free environment for three months. Then they'll go back into the mainstream, back to an environment which is anything but drug-free. Well, it's like anywhere. I mean, if you're it doesn't matter if you're a drug user on the outside or the inside, you're still a drug user, you've still got an addiction and um, you can still get it. There's no problems about that. I've used heroin in every prison that I've been to in New South Wales. Mainly it's a matter of money because uh, it's an expensive drug, especially in jail and place. The price is further inflated than what it would normally be on the street. I, um, if you haven't got the money, there are other ways to get it, although you can't get a regular supply. Um, some people, uh, <laughs> how can I put it, compromise themselves sexually to get it. Um, other people might be lucky. You run into people that you do business with, like drugs, on the street, and they get some and they're prepared to give you a shot. Um, you can swap TVs for it, radios, that sort of thing. <coughs> The authorities are trying hard to choke off the flow of heroin, but it seeps through the thinness in the system. These men belong to an emergency unit. The units are not new, they've been around for years, to put down riots, to troubleshoot. Now their time is mostly spent hunting for drugs. Ramping, the prisoners call it. Where is he? Good fellow. Come on over here. Get, Get that dummy, mate. Where's he put it? Where's he put it? Where is it? Good lad. That's my boy. Good boy. Special search buddy just come outside in. These special searches are almost as much of a surprise to the prison staff as they are to the prisoners. The emergency units keep their plans to themselves because it's not just the prisoners and their families who are suspects. There has been cases where prison officers have brought it in uh, and they have been brought to trial and they have been given prison sentences. And as far as we're concerned, uh, any prison officer who brings drugs into a prison should be jailed because he has got no right to abuse the position he's in to prey on the misfortunes of prisoners. I've had 
good reasons for suspecting that some police officers have brought drugs into prison as part of a possible conspiracy with some people who have broken the law. At least the allegations have been made, and while I couldn't prove it, I had a warm conviction that this was the case when I had an administrative responsibility and tried to do something about it. Time was when cell searches would yield instruments of violence, guns made of water pipe in a prison workshop, knives stolen from the kitchen and filed into bayonets, makeshift weaponry contrived from anything of... But now the searchers find the weapons of another kind of war, that some wage against their own bodies. The syringe is hard to hide, bulky and fragile. So prison ingenuity is applied to the problem. Because the syringe is about that long, you know, they cut them down so that they're only about that long. So all you've got is just a, a cut down tube of plastic with a needle on the end and a tiny little plunger about that long. So when you hold it, you sort of just sort of like that, real, very hard and stiff. And after a while, the rubber in the syringe wears out. So some people sort of get very inventive and they get a, a thong, a rubber thong, and they cut off a piece of the rubber thong, and they, a needle, and put it into the syringe itself, tie a bit of cotton around the, plunger, the white plunger, stick the needle into the syringe itself, into the rubber, have it tied around to the, the plunger so you can use the rubber thong. Thong is a suction thing exactly the same way. And you know, like it's sort of, you can, because they're so compact you can sort of carry them anywhere rather than carrying a big bulky thing so you can just sort of shove it up your backside in a piece of plastic and elastic band wrapped around it or carry it in your hand like that or in any way you want to. The syringes get used by different people sometimes up to you know maybe 30 odd people might use the same syringe uh, some people have their own you know, but a lot of the time, especially if you're in a situation where um, uh, you've just come across somebody that's got some heroin or whatever and, and you want to have a hit, um, you're not going to hassle around for too long trying to find a good syringe, you know, if, uh, if there's one available you use it, because you're usually in that sort of frame of mind, but uh, not thinking about tomorrow, you're just thinking about right now and feeling okay. People don't sort of disregard the syringe until it's cracked or until the needle's just completely wrecked, you know, blunt like a nail and you sort of push it in your skin, your skin folds like that to try and get it in. And then after they've used it, they sort of, and then someone might say, oh, someone, they might suddenly find out like they did in, in the MTC, there's 20 or 30 odd blokes using the same syringe and one of them had AIDS and ended up in the MRP hospital, so everyone freaked out. But it still didn't stop anybody from using it because it's, you know, you think, ah, oh, well, it won't happen to me. Prisoners are at particularly high risk of becoming infected with the AIDS virus. Uh, the prison population is an isolated, closed population. The level of, of IV drug use and homosexual contact in prisons has been recognised all over the world. And despite studies um, that may not have supported the widespread use of drugs in prisons, I think it's very widely accepted by prison authorities and certainly by prisoners themselves that these practices go on and therefore um, the AIDS epidemic will inevitably be a major problem in the prison system. When I was working in the AIDS unit, I was counselling a young inmate and during the course of his counselling he informed me that he was the 21st user of a syringe. It makes you wonder who he passed it on to and how many more have used the syringe since. But it also makes me wonder is, was it initially infected by the first user, the second user, the third user, or somewhere else, somewhere along the line, and if so, where are those other people?